America is home to 33 million small businesses, the beating heart of communities across the country. And proof that the American dream is still alive. This is a show about those dreamers and doers and the communities they serve. Their real life stories. Their struggles and successes. Their grit, determination, and passion. And the people who fight to keep their American dream alive. I'm Alfredo Ortiz. I'm Elaine Parker. And it's time for another episode of Main Street Matters. America's small business megaphone. Hi, and welcome to Main Street Matters, uh, America's small business megaphone. We're here today. Uh, I'm Jamie Bowers. I'm the executive producer of Main Street Matters, and I'm here with Jordan Bruno. Hi, I'm Jordan Bruno. I'm the communications director of Job Creators Network. We are excited today. We're filling in for Alfredo and Elaine, uh, but that means we get to talk to Lee Risotto, uh, and he is the former Consul General of Bermuda and former Senior VP of Conair, uh, a company which his father founded, uh, which was a really interesting story. He's a, a second time guest here. Uh, so we are excited to have him. And if you want to hear a lot more about his entrepreneurial roots, please reference uh, the show notes where we'll link to our previous podcast with him. Uh, Lee, welcome back to the show. We appreciate you coming here. Um, we'd love to talk to you about a recent op-ed that you just placed with uh, with Alfredo. Well, thank you, Jamie. And uh, I'd like to start off and clarify, my I'm not an economist and, and I'm not a politician. My background foremost is I'm a businessman. And as a business person, you have to learn how to uh, identify market uh, situations, whether they're opportunities or sometimes uh, adverse uh, conditions. But mo most important is to be able to read, read into the market and people's needs, interests, and uh, opportunities. It, you're you're totally right, um, and I think uh, too often the American government does not act uh, like a business, and and it really shows when it comes to their use of debt as a way to uh, you know as a daily operational tool. Uh, it's it's really out of control. Yeah, Lee, thanks a lot for taking the time to join us. Um, the, the topic today really is this op-ed of yours that you and Alfredo wrote together in Breitbart, highlighting just how out of control the federal debt is and your uh, partial solution, or at least first step of a solution to really scale back on foreign aid. Um, do you think you could just take a few moments to explain kind of your argument around the debt and how um, reigning in foreign aid could kind of be a first bite at the debt apple? Sure, absolutely. The... Uh... Conceptually, what I'm pointing out and, you know, is reflective uh, of this uh, article is the United States has many allies and it has a, a heart bigger than probably all the other countries combined. So we're always there wanting to help, you know, those in need, particularly our allies. And the disconnect that I see is quite often when there are countries in need of aid and in need of help, you know, we're, we're the first to, to provide that, but we're doing it in the form of, of a grant or, a, a, you know, just a, a checkbook as though we got it from Santa Claus. And what doesn't make sense is a lot of these countries, most in fact, are, are countries that have uh, assets, resources, pretty solid financial uh, uh, positions. So, I'm all for helping those in need. And at the same time, as a businessman, as a, as a taxpayer, want to be smart enough to say, hey, I'll help you, but I do expect that you pay me back, right? And I do expect that you, you pay back uh, the taxpayers. Why is the, the American taxpayer considered to be Santa Claus with, with all these countries? So you, you take an example, uh, you know, uh, of the, uh, the current situation we have with our deficit, we, we, we are incurring $2 billion a day in, in interest payments just to pay our debt. So it, it, it's, it's a huge number. And at some point, we have to answer to the taxpayer and, and be responsible and respectful to the dollars that were taken from the taxpayer. 
Yeah, at least some of the statistics you have in your op-ed are absolutely shocking. Um, I mean, just a couple that jumped out at me. Uh, it took 200 years, over 200 years for the country to accrue its first trillion dollars of debt. And just three months, less than three months, in fact, for it to, cr for it to accrue its latest trillion dollars of debt. Um, the other one that jumped out at me is uh, net deficit payments, net interest payments on the on the debt are going to be the third largest uh, source of the budget in a few years, just behind Social Security and Medicare. I mean, th those are really striking statistics. But for a lot of ordinary Americans, they might say, OK, but how does the debt actually affect me? I mean, if they're not expecting the IRS to show up at the door with a bill for them, what would you say to those people? Well, look, look what happened uh, in the news most recently in uh, New York City that and I'm, I'm going to create an analogy, but ultimately it's the, the, the same uh, you know, uh, situation and that they uh, taken children out of schools because they need room to house migrants that they don't know where to put the put these individuals. And ultimately, they don't have the building, they don't the, the buildings, they don't have the resources for them. And they're taking kids out of school, right? So those, those are kids from taxpayer families. So they're, they're being affected. Now, in, in that scenario, it's not because of the debt, it, it's just because of how we're running our government. The, the debt it ultimately will uh, inhibit our ability to provide various services because at some point you can't just have an endless open checkbook so there's only there's only so many dollars that could be spent although washington very much enjoys printing printed money but w w there's points where we have to stop spending because the, the money just isn't there and that's going to ultimately uh, translate into uh, social services whether it could, could could you know stem all the way down to national parks you know it, it, it's across the board you know the 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 enjoyment of being in america being an american and, and having the luxuries that we have that we've worked hard for and earned should not be taken away because of irresponsible spending yeah it's you know i think it's so hard we we just as as humans we have a hard time understanding these massive numbers you know in the the idea of 2 billion dollars a day just being paid on the interest meaning we're spending 2 billion dollars and getting nothing in return other than the the ability to borrow borrow that money um i think people kind of understand that if you have a uh, a credit card that you rack up a lot of debt on and you only pay the minimum payment that, you know, whatever you bought with that credit card, whether it was a couch or a TV uh, or a washing machine is going to end up costing you so much more uh, than when if you had just saved your money and paid cash for it. And, and I think really as a country, we are wasting billions of, of dollars, uh, trillions of dollars in interest payments uh, because we could not uh, contain ourselves. We couldn't show any kind of restraint. And I think I think your point on the foreign aid is you know, a great one. I mean, uh, not only should we probably curb a lot of that foreign aid, but some of the things that we're spending on now, it, it isn't a matter of being mean or cruel to uh, individuals, but if you don't have the money uh, at a certain point, you can't, do whatever that activity is that you want to do, whether it's, and it could be defense, anything. So I'm proposing that not necessarily that we do not give the aid. However, certainly in some cases we should strongly uh, further evaluate, you know, whether or not, you know, and how, how well those dollars are being spent. But take Ukraine as example. We already gave about a hundred billion dollars. They're looking for another sixty or eighty billion, right? So here, here's a simple math: if if we're if just the interest on the debt is two billion dollars a day, and instead of um, just giving them this money that we it was in the form of a loan, and they're they're pay they're paying interest now, and they're going to have the responsibility of paying back those loans. That would equate to three months of the interest payments of our debt. So if we got 12 months in a year and you got Ukraine alone, that now you found a solution to cover three months of your debt payments, 
Well, that's a start. And the opportunity is by working intelligently, we could find minimum the, the, to, the ability to cover through cut-in expenses the other nine months of interest payments. So at the, we do not further increase the debt. In addition, if it's given as a loan as opposed to a grant, it's not on your balance sheet as, as a, a debt, which increases the deficit. It's on your balance sheet as an asset. So we, we, have these, we would have these assets, and maybe some in the future at some point, the, uh, the, the government could decide you may want to forgive some, but you, that, that should be few and far between. But at the same time, what China does is they'll loan money well, they'll go and build infrastructure in different countries. And if those countries do not pay it back, China has uh, an agreement where they take collateral. So if the country doesn't pay it back and that country has rare earth minerals, guess what? China's taken the rare earth minerals from that country. And we should be smart enough to do the same. We're, we're doing it out of the goodness of our heart. We're doing it in, in goodwill. These are allies of ours. But likewise, if, they, if we should get something back, and I think there's another very important point that needs to be uh, brought up, and there's so many countries that consistently choose not to vote con with the U.S. in the U.N. So they'll take completely opposing positions on you know, major issues that you know, America feels strong about. And meanwhile, these are the same countries we're giving money to. So how can we give money to countries consistently that vote against us? So now, at least if you had a loan and you said, hey, this country doesn't, you know, uh, you know, support our, our values, maybe we should call these loans. Yeah, Lee, that's that's interesting. That kind of gets to my next question. Uh, the, you know, the, I think the pushback to your argument from the so-called development community, uh, the, the elites in um, Brussels, would would say something along the lines of, look, giving loans to some of these countries just risks putting them in a debt spiral because they aren't going to be able, a lot of them aren't going to be able to pay it back. Um, so that's why just pure grants are better to them. But would you, would your response to that kind of criticism be there needs to be some sort of collateralization? A absolutely. And just for, just for the record, a as example, if you look up the, G the uh, world GDP by country, and uh, United, uh, 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 the good news is United States is number one for now. <laughs> but if, if you study the, uh, the 177 countries where GDP is published, so look at uh, the, the, top, the most recent topic uh, of conversation, which is Israel. So Israel is, is ranked number 27. Okay. If you uh, look down the list, number 28 is United Arab Emirates. Number 33 is Singapore. Number uh, 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 Luxembourg is in the 50s. So you have all these countries. Israel actually is stronger than 85% of the 177 countries. So again, if Israel needs our help, I'm the first one to say, let's help them. But why wouldn't that be a loan that... I'm not saying it should be a 12-month payback. It should be something intelligently you know, uh, figured out, which maybe it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It could be a long-term loan, so you're not strangling those countries. But if, if they're stronger than 85% of all the other countries, why are we giving handouts to, to countries like that? Yeah, I mean, they often have higher standards of living than us, so you can understand why there's frustration with uh, this type of loans to, to prop up people who, on many metrics, have better living standards than an ordinary American. So th there's, there's much, op the good news is there's much opportunity that we could find solutions to, to stop the increase in our deficit and, and actually reduce the deficit. The question is, does our Congress truly want to do that? And it seems like it's uh, passing the hot potato back and forth. And we hear a lot of rhetoric, but we, we, we need our Congress on both sides of the aisle to, you know, say, hey, what is wrong with a position of America first? We're still willing to help the work rest of the world. What all we're suggesting is let's be intelligent about how we do it. One of the things I think is 
is always interesting when you get into these debates and you hear politicians, whether it's the White House or Congress, talking about debt and deficits is do you do either of you feel that the American public understands the difference between a deficit and the debt? Because there seems to be a lot of wordplay from politicians. We're we're reducing the deficit, which sounds like you're reducing maybe what we owe, but not really. Yeah, that's one of Biden's favorites. Uh, came in, reduced it from three trillion to two trillion, and so he just brags about cutting the deficit. I mean, when it's still a ridiculous number for an economy that's supposedly at full capacity to be increasing the deficit every year by two trillion, it's just absolutely ridiculous. I don't know what you think about Ali. Well, yeah, I, I agree. And yes, you, you do have to. I, I think people understand it, but sometimes you have to, you know, exp ex simply explain it and, and remind them of the difference be between the two. And, th and that's fine. People do get it. And people, when you show them, I, I think, uh, intelligent examples of how that money, you know, uh, you know affects them. So you, you take example, uh, you know, the, the 100 trillion that went to Ukraine already. There's been different uh, reports discussing how you could have solved homelessness in America three, four, potentially five times over 100 percent solve homelessness with that same hundred billion dollars. So even if it was only one time over, period, end of story, if we were able to get rid of homelessness but meanwhile, you sent a hundred million, a hundred billion dollars to a country that's unaccountable for, mm -hmm. you know, at least if they could say, OK, this is what we did with it. This is how you know, we we ended the war. We solved, you know, the, uh, the the crisis over there. That's one thing. But the money keeps going into black holes that people get very frustrated about. And meanwhile, we have our own problems with, within our own country that could have been solved. Yeah, I think the stat in your op-ed is that more money has gone to Ukraine than the entire Department of Transportation. And when you think of the roads and the bridges and the infrastructure in, in the U.S., I mean, that's a pretty striking statistic. Right. So every time yet you have a, a commuter going to work and hit in a pothole <laughs> or a bump in the road or, you know, bridge that, you know, was told, you know, it need, need, needs to be repaired. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, our money was sent to another country. Yeah. So I think fiscal conservatives were heartened a little bit recently by the deal in Congress that at least cuts discretionary spending slightly from last year. You know, it's a start. Obviously, a lot of us would like a lot more. Um, but hey, at least drawing a line in the sand is a start. Um, that is going to be working its way through. I mean, there's, there is an agreement on it. But then on the other hand, you have this package that you mentioned earlier in the show, this um, $100 billion dollar foreign aid package that sends another $61 billion to Ukraine. What would your message be for Congress um, as it as it's hammering out this $100 billion foreign aid package? Personally, I'm not in favor of the dollars going anywhere unless I know exactly how they're going to be spent. And they're, they're, you know, there's accountability on, on the, those dollars. But whether I'm for that or against it, my, my, my position is if, if you asked anyone receiving this aid, here's your choice. You get the aid in the form of a loan or you don't get the aid. 99% of the time, they're going to still take the aid, correct? So why, why make it a taxpayer gift as opposed to uh, at least making it a long-term loan that uh, gives the, the taxpayer back something? I, I absolutely agree, and I and I think um, the collateralization of some of those things is also good. It might mean that we get a military base out of it. It might mean, you know, like you said, mining rights or uh, other things. Um, I think Jordan, you bring you brought up the counter argument that that you then get a debt cycle, and, and it happened a lot in South America and Central That's America. That's right. Mm -hmm. where these countries yeah. borrowed money that they knew they wouldn't be able to pay back and, it, and then it crippled their future economy. So I think um, in some ways uh, we have to look at other solutions, but there is no reason why, by, why the American taxpayers should just gift, you know, 
billions of dollars to to everybody in need. Let, let the gifts be the exception and not the norm. So as, a, as a, I pointed out early on, the, the heart of the people of the United States is bigger than, than the, the whole world combined. And the United States people would be willing and want to always you know, be the first out there to help you know, those in need. But when, when it's, when it's going to be a gift, let that be the exception. And that's okay that we can have exceptions and have situations each year that, you know, there's different countries that need that help that, you know, aren't financially sound enough to pay it back. But the ones that can and have the resources, as the former President Trump has stated, you know, the, the Gulf Wars that we, we've been, we're in, we never took a, a barrel of oil. And meanwhile, you, you had, you know, liquid gold over there. And we're, we're spending billions and billions and billions, literally hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, that we, we spent in, in the Middle East and never got, you know, anything back for it. Yeah, I think what this this whole conversation more broadly is often missing is that nothing's stopping ordinary Americans out of the goodness of their heart from donating to these causes. And we do in numbers in the hundreds of billions. Um, and I think Israel is a great example. I mean, if you look at all the NGOs set up to help them and the, and the private money and the um, philanthropy that goes there, I mean, not, none of this conversation touches that private lending. It's just the forced taxpayer funds that we're concerned about. Is that right? Absolutely correct. It, the, 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 the American people, whether it's through the government uh, programs or, or uh, private always come through in, in a tremendous way. So Lee, what do you, how do you feel about a, a balanced budget amendment uh, that would kind of force Congress to only spend what they bring in? What, you know, there, I, I've seen lots of arguments on both sides of that. What, what's your feeling? By law, it's supposed to be a balanced budget. And that's where these uh, continuing resolutions, you know, keep re reoccurring unfortunately, that uh, it, it, it's as though it's a game that our politicians know well how to play and ultimately, you know, let the clock time out and uh, force a continuing resolution, you know, to, to uh, have this, you know, again, basically blank checkbook and, or overwrite the, the law that says it's supposed to be a balanced budget. So I, I think... What, what's uh, the most recent indicator that we should all make reference to is look what just took place in Iowa, that you, you, you have uh, President Trump, which is, you know, preaching, you know, very strong conservative policies and positions and, and wants to have, uh, you know, uh, a balanced budget and a strong uh, U.S. economy. And. 98 out of 99 counties, he overwhelmingly won. The one that he lost was by literally one vote. He won the uh, the uh, the caucus by over 50 percent. The people are, uh, are saying loud and clear, enough of this nonsense. We want to fix America when we want somebody to fix America. Right. No, Lee. I mean, certainly uh, compared to the Democrats, any anything is better. But what? How do you how do you deal with the pushback that? Republicans, including Trump, have been almost as bad on deficit spending as Democrats over the years. Well, in, in, in fairness, you know, we in the middle of the Trump presidency, you, you, you got hit with COVID. And I, I believe uh, they tried to do the correct thing and they had to put the stimulus money out there. And that, you know, created, you know, this uh, tremendous uh, additional debt. However. Uh, what we where, where, where we need to focus is on uh, the Congress, uh, wh whether it's the House and the Senate, to force them to stop these uh, continuous uh, resolutions and uh, having a, a balanced budget. So what's been proposed recently, I guess the Freedom Caucus guys, in respect to having separate bills for each you know department. And again, that brings transparency and uh, makes it a clearly definable, you know, what the spending is and uh, having everybody sign off on it.
Yeah, that would definitely be a great step. And yeah, people people forget a lot. They look at the president, just say who's in office, but forget that obviously it's Congress that has the power of the purse. It's Congress where the spendings come from. Obviously, the president can push one way or the other. And certainly with the current president we have now, always pushing for more spending. But um, yeah, we really, we really hope that Congress can step up and rein in some of this reckless spending that has driven inflation so high that um, life is unaffordable for a lot of ordinary folks right now. I, I I think it would be surprising, or it shouldn't be surprising, if a survey was done uh, today with the people asking the question. Because what what's coming up, you know, uh, is this challenge that if uh, the Democrats in the White House is uh, going to hold back on supporting the border bill, HR two. And uh, you use that as uh, use closing down the government to make to make the Republicans look bad, right? So ultimately, the the people have to say, you know what? Let's close the government down if that's what it takes to fix our borders because we're we're, we're, we're killing the country as we speak. So if if we have if we need to do a reset and shut the government down, we should. And by the way. When the government is shut down, you know, the, it, it's, it's nothing that anybody wants to do. But at the same time, all the employees get back pay. So if it's shut down for two weeks or four weeks or eight weeks, no one's not going to miss a paycheck. They, you know, it'll be delayed, but they'll all get their back pay. And if that's what it takes to fix the border and get Congress to do their job, then hey, we, we should do what we have to do. Last question from me, Lee. Uh, you, you admit in the op-ed that while well, the foreign aid turning into loans is, is a, you know, a very compelling idea, it still is just a drop in the debt bucket. What else would you look at in the budget, whether it's entitlements, whether it's military spending, uh, whether it's the, the vast welfare transfer state to try to cut back on some of this spending to get to a balanced budget? So uh, uh, again, let, let's ask the people what they want and or tailor our programs to what the people want. It, it, you know, I think you're hard pressed to get any type of significant majority uh, across the entire country to say FBI deserves a new headquarters. But meanwhile, <laughs> in, the, in the budget, you got hundreds of billions of dollars for a new, uh, new headquarters, which actually... Over time, I, I, I think added up to uh, um, much, it was a much greater number. I, I don't have it off the top of my head. Same thing. The, does the uh, IRS deserve? They have a twelve billion dollar budget to begin with. Should we really be giving them another eighty billion dollars when we know that they're part of our weaponization problem in this country, as opposed to saying? Let's spend the twelve billion that they have intelligently, and the eighty billion it shouldn't be spent today. You know, maybe down the road somewhere in the future, if, if it's justified that they should have extra dollars, that should be evaluated. But when you don't have the money and you keep spending as though you do, that could, that that's our problem. So that those are two areas that right there. That's hundreds of billions of dollars of savings. And if we go through category by category, the dollars are there that we can have a significant impact. Uh, have either of you seen, uh, it was Kevin Klein in the movie Dave, where he is kind of a presidential impersonator and then the president goes into a coma and he has to, to play the role of president. And at one point he brings in his own personal account. He runs like a temp agency and to help him do, you know, balance the budget. And Charles Grodin has this whole thing of like, I can't believe what we're doing here. You know, like we're, we're letting, you know, we're paying uh, our defense contractors up front. We're doing all this stuff. And, you know, as they sit there, there's kind of this common sense line by line. Do we really need that? That seems dumb. Do we really need that? And uh, it, it's, uh, it's one of my favorite scenes. I wish, uh, we could have that execute that in real life. I'll YouTube that when as soon as we're finished here. <laughs> well, you, you know, you, you make light uh, of the example. However, it, going through it in a fundamental, intelligent way, a common sense approach. Unfortunately, common sense is not common, right? 
But yeah. it, if you go through it in a, in a fundamental approach, you you even that local small time accountant can offer solutions that uh, you know we, we choose to do it in a way that by design is costing far more dollars than it should. And uh, you know I hate to use uh, you know uh, you know keep re referring to deep deep state or swamp, but we, we have to decide where we're getting a return on our dollars spent and where we are not, that's the first place you make the cuts. So you have to say to yourself, okay, Department of Energy, here's my budget. What am I what have they produced for me? If they're not producing, I'm not saying to eliminate them, but certainly you should cut them. Department of Education, what are you doing? How, where, where's the education level of the average American, you know, student? You're not producing? Well, maybe we should turn it over to the states, right? And, and all these departments that have huge budgets, it's, it, it, it certainly justifies, you know, the, the time today that we reevaluate the dollars they're given and the, the money that the, the taxpayer money that they're spending. Thank you, Lee, so much for joining us and uh, kind of going through this really important argument and sharing the op-ed with us. Um, some really interesting ideas. I hope uh, some some legislators are listening and watching right now uh, and taking some notes here. So thank you so much for joining us here on Main Street Matters. Thank oh, you, Lee. Thank you, gentlemen. And glad to be with you guys. Keep it up. Wonderful. Uh, to our listeners, please subscribe on uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we are here talking about issues that affect small businesses and issues that affect uh, everyday Americans uh, twice a week. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good day.